And let's share the screen with the meeting minutes. And I guess the first point on the agenda is uh, questions and issues. Open forum if anyone has anything uh, they want to raise. What's not on the agenda? I think one thing that I heard mentioned earlier this week that was going to be discussed was the potential um, use of a canary to uh, test the state of the cluster. Yeah, I think that's in the proposals section. Oh, sorry. Okay, so if we don't have anything, then let's look at some of the open PRs and issues. Uh, so there was this PR with the, with the container image for the build. Uh, Jakub, I think you said you will look yeah. at if it has any use for tests. Yeah, I was looking into it uh, yesterday more closely and uh, I found that uh, the use case which we want to implement at some point and use uh, containers that system test is not the same as is described in this PR and I think uh, there is no real uh, usage of this at this moment even in our CR, uh, even in our CI. That's it. So I think we can close it if uh, there are no objections. Yeah, I think last time Marco himself said that he basically doesn't have this updated because he's not using it anymore. So yeah, I'm not sure there's anyone else using this. Okay, then uh, the other pull request is, uh, or the issue is about what happens with the Kafka rebalance when it's created before cruise control is deployed. Paolo, did you edit it to the agenda or did I do it? Uh, yes, I did it because, uh, yeah, I'd like to discuss in order to make a final decision. So the, the problem that you raised for the others was that uh, uh, if you, for example, deploy a Kafka cluster without the cruise control running, and you then uh, create uh, a Kafka rebalance resource, of course, uh, nothing happens. But when you uh, update your Kafka custom resource to add cruise control and cruise control is deployed, the Kafka rebalance resource is not handled by the Kafka rebalance resource operator. And uh, the reason why it happens is because uh, by design um, for, um, for problems like this, and I will uh, mm, talk more about other uh, use cases, um, you have to add an annotation on the Kafka rebalance resource, which is the refresh annotation to push the operator, the Kafka rebalance operator to take care of the resource. And then in that case, having cruise control handle, uh, handling the, the, the optimization proposal for you and so on. So um, the reason why it uh, was working in this way and by design with Tom Cooper and Kyle um, was that uh, mostly <clears throat> Um, the, the use case when, for example, you you have cruise control running and uh, you have a Kafka rebalance resource with some errors, uh, your mistakes, I don't know, some um, uh, goals not supported or, or things like that. Um, without using uh, this way, so applying a refresh when you fix the error, it means that um, uh, on uh, each reconcile loop, so every two minutes by, by default, 
uh, there is uh, a call to the cruise control API and uh, on, um, on the cruise control side, maybe something wrong can happen if uh, the Kafka rebalance is, uh, is broken somehow by mistakes made by the user. Uh, so to avoid th these kind of things, and maybe Tom Cooper has some more use cases, uh, we decided to go for a refresh annotation. When you create a Kafka rebalance resource with an error, the first uh, time it's um, uh, the REST API on cruise control is called, the operator gets the error, and then uh, the, the, the state machine, let me say, move in a not ready state where you have to apply this refresh after fixing uh, the Kafka rebalance. Uh, maybe this way can work in these use cases. Maybe, uh, as Jakub raised, is not the real way for the other one. So when you don't have cruise control, but you have Kafka rebalance, then you deploy cruise control, but you have to apply refresh anyway. And the other use case that I found is uh, even when um, you create a Kafka rebalance resource, you have to specify uh, the label. Uh, so inside the label, the Kafka cluster um, related to this Kafka rebalance resource where you want to apply the rebalance. And uh, it means that if you deploy the Kafka rebalance, so you have risk control running, you create a Kafka rebalance resource, but you forget the label specifying the cluster. You can, of course, adding the label because you, you can see in the status of the resource that something goes wrong because there is this label missing. You add the label, but at that point, you still need to add this annotation, this refresh annotation for, um, yeah, for having the operator taking care of the resource. So on one side, I have these two use cases that maybe are not ideal in this way, applying this uh, refresh annotation. On the other side, uh, when you have uh, real mistakes that can impact cruise control, having the annotation, uh, we thought that could be better. And uh, yeah, for now, what the, 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 the kind of workaround of the solution was just to be clear in the documentation that um, you have to apply this annotation when you don't have cruise control running, but the Kafka rebalance is there, or you, forgot about, uh, you forget about the, the, the cluster level. So uh, I, to, to be honest, I don't have a strong mm, opinion on uh, if we should handle this uh, two specific use cases differently. So not having the annotation, but just having the operator handling, uh, which means off the top of my hand, having another state, maybe in the state machine of the, the operator, because it's, it's a different state that we have to handle. Uh, so I'd like to know for the others, uh, how is this uh, UX? So how is the, uh, the user experience? Uh, what do you think about that? And uh, yeah, we can make a decision. To, to open a PR or fixing in a, in a better way this thing, or we are okay with the current way. I don't know if uh, Tom is on call, right? Tom Cooper, if I want to add something to what I said, but Tom is not on call, so. So that's it. I don't know if the others are, have some different opinions on this bad or not user experience. Yaro, mute Jakub. I can see you talking. I obviously think that the situation when the resource is created when cruise control is not deployed <clears throat> or with the label. I think they are different than error in the proposal. And I don't think you should need the annotation. That's why I obviously yeah, yeah. raised the, the issue. So just to edit for the record. So uh, as you already mentioned, I. I would agree with you. I have not a strong opinion, but I, I would agree with you. So if uh, we are just you and me on, on this uh, on this thing uh, with this opinion, I think that we can even yeah improve at least for these two use, specific use cases. 
and uh, avoiding to add the annotation if the others agree or or maybe the silence is just agreement So for now, we don't have any other kind of specific use case and I don't see them. So maybe handling if in, in a different ways, it's fine. Can you specify the, the, the label about the cluster? That the, yeah, that uh, cluster label or something like that, yeah. So at the same time, I don't really think this is priority, right? So I don't think it's necessarily something you have to jump on right away, right? And if we put there just some label and let it there for the time when we get bored, that's also completely fine with me. Okay. Well, let's see. If I get bored of doing some other work, I can just work on it. Yeah, I, I really raised it because I wanted to have it tracked. Uh, yeah, yeah, but not necessarily because it's some important issue which needs to be fixed ASAP or something. No, no, yes, even because anyway, it's not a bug. So there, there is a way for uh, for the user to to have it working. Yeah. It's just applying the annotation. Okay, so like this. Yeah, I'm fine with it. Okay, so I guess that's the issues and PRs which we had on the list. Now, next thing are the proposals. And this is the proposal for the admin API server for the UI. And I think, I think, I think, I think, Tom Bentley, your you had some comments and I think you should check whether they were or were not done by the commits from Green and approve or... Okay, yeah, yeah, I can do that. Sorry, I dropped the ball on this one. And assuming he addressed all of them, that should be then all the approvals, so we should be able to merge it right after we approve it. Can I just ask a quick question about um, that uh, proposal? Um, there was a reference in there about uh, using the Java 11 um, platform module system. Um, I know that uh, Strimzy has gone to Java 11, but are still running a uh, language level of Java 8. Um, as this is a new uh, proposal and a new repository, um, I've I originally created that uh, that kind of draft PR, and I've modded, modified it to use um, Java 11 modularity. Um, but is are we happy that uh, we should proceed on this repository using the uh, the modularity? Um, I mean, if you look across the uh, the tools and things that are available, it seems like. Uh, there was a lot of a, or a scramble for doing things when Java 9 was take was brought out, but um, it hasn't kind of moved on from then. So things like Maven plugins for JLink and for JMods uh, are still in alpha, um, th that kind of thing. Um, so um, as I say, do we want to develop it using Java 11 modularity and just work around those kind of limitations? 
So I think I can answer the first part of the question. The Strumzi operators will move to language level 11 uh, <clears throat> after the 020 is released. So that's the, that's the plan approved uh, in the past that the 019 and 020 will use the Java 11 as a runtime. And then yep. for 21, we moved to Java 11 completely and dropped Java 8 from the operators. So I don't think that part is in any kind of problem. But to be honest, I have no idea about the modularity. Maybe Tom, you... Yeah, I can say something about that. Um, my feeling is we, you know, we should... Um, it's going to happen eventually, but I don't think we need to make a decision here and now. Um, when it comes to sort of merging this proposal. Um, you know, I don't think it, we should mandate it in the proposal. And I think we should um, basically just try and be as compatible with modularity for the future. But if there's stuff that we can't do today because dependencies don't support modularity, then, you know, I think that's fine. We just proceed not using um, Java modules for the time being. Okay, so and I'm, I'm I flexible, agree. Basically, right. I agree. It shouldn't be in the proposal, um, and we can support modules at the moment. Um, as I say, I've modified that draft PR that I created so that it uses uh, modules, and um, it's just that, as I say, the the kind of convenient tooling. So, for example, if you want to uh, use JLink, uh, we might have to write a script to do it rather than using the Maven stuff itself. Um, but I think it's a, a good idea to go that way because um, we're going to get there at some point in the future anyway. So as this is a brand new repository with a brand new uh, build of something, uh, we might as well um, try and do it from the outset. Then it'll save us uh, hassles landed later down the line. Yeah, sounds good to me. So I guess that answered the question. Uh, yeah, it does. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, okay, anything else to this proposal? Okay, in that case, uh, the other proposal which we wanted to discuss was uh, the one about the uh, canary, I guess. Uh, Paolo, do you have somewhere some notes about the things which you wanted to discuss about it? I think that uh, we have Rob Shelley on the call, right? Yeah, hey, Rob. Yeah, yeah, um, we can jump into this. So, I think the, the main talking point we had left after the call we had on Tuesday was discussing where the code for the canary would live. Would it be in the Z operator repo or would it be in its own repo within the Z project? I think that's really the main issue we had left up needed to discuss. And I guess to answer that, we need to also answer the question whether it would run inside the operator or whether it would run as a separate bot, basically, right? Yeah, I think I think we were leaning towards it would be its own pod. Yeah, I think that uh, yeah, as you already mentioned uh, a few days ago, I guess that uh, running it in a different pod is fine. My only concern is about maybe Tom Bentley can can have a different opinion about. How are we going to integrate maybe in, in the future if it's needed this component with the with the Kafka roller, right? Uh, so our intention will be to try to start uh, uh, easy for now. So just trying to have a canary tool that is able to send some messages to some topics and then uh, consuming them to see if Kafka is working. Uh, but of, of course, as Tom Bendel already mentioned, it can be used for a more uh, um, specific purpose, even for the Kafka roller. And having it run outside of the operator, it also means that we have to expose a kind of uh, 
REST API or uh, I don't know, the Kafka roller is able to get uh, metrics from uh, the, the Canary tool in order to do what it needs. Yeah, I'm quite happy with starting with something sort of small and specific because I don't think we're in a position to use this uh, in the Kafka roller imminently. Um, if there needs to be a REST API, then fine. Another way that you could do it, though, is you could just have, um, you could be running it in a separate pod, the, the producer part and maybe um, some consumer part um, as well. But you could always consume from the topic in order to determine um, whether or not the, um, the broker was working. Um, so you could use the topic as the API Oh, or the, the, the CO could use the topic as the API rather than having to call out to a, a, a REST thing. But I don't care at this point. Um, I think we can, you know, make progress with it um, and make that decision later on. So the plan would be that the canary would be Right now, in the first version, the canary will be basically completely separate pods, which will be deployed by a new section inside the custom resource. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe with some configuration that we have to define based on what the canary tool has to do. And to be honest, I guess I think at this point that it could be. So I would like the idea to have this as a, another repo under the stream is the organization. Maybe yes, can... so I guess technically we can integrate it in the same way as we do with the bridge, for example, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, you mean having a different cast? custom resource or having a section in the Kafka custom resource then? No section in the Kafka custom resource. So okay. if you probably need to manage it from there if you later want to use the topics, for example, because you need to be able to find out if it's configured and so on. Oh, yeah, yeah. So the separate repo suggested by Paolo sounds reasonable for everyone. Okay, so uh, I can set up the repo if you want. Yeah. Well, we should first update the proposal accordingly, oh, yeah. right? Before we create yes. the repos and so on and get it approved. Yeah, uh, I'll update so, the proposal with all of that info now. So, what about the languages for that? Do we have some limitations or preferences or? Do we give that more as a free choice to Rob? So one of my concerns was that if it runs in yet another repository, if it runs as a JVM, it can mean more resources consumed in addition than uh, if it's, for example, native binary by Quarkus or written in Golang or something like that. But I'm not sure what the others think about it. My only concern um, with something written in Golang, for example, um, would be uh, my ability to review it. I don't know, I can't speak for other um, people's knowledge of Golang, but mine is very weak. Um, so, but that's not a reason not to. If that's the best technical choice, then I think we should do that.
So Rob, what's your feeling on that? Because uh, yeah, I, I guess that you are the one that is going to work mostly on this. I will help, of course, uh, whatever will be the language that you choose. Uh, yeah, so myself and Jeremy were, were both doing some work on this. And initially, I think we were kind of leaning towards Golang. So, Tom, Samuel, Jakub, does it sound OK for you? Yes. Fine by me. Sam? So sorry. Um, yeah, no, that sounds reasonable to me. Okay, uh, anything else to move this proposal forward or? Uh, no, just that uh, I guess Rob should narrow down, um, should narrow down the, 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 the proposal about removing things like disk usage and disk errors, uh, things like that, because yeah, it's something that we cannot check just with producer and consumer. Right, Rob? Yeah, I'll get all that pushed and, <clears throat> excuse me, and I'll get these changes in as well. So I'll have that done in a couple of hours. Yeah, and you can even update with these outcomes from uh, the calls today about the language, about uh, running outside uh, and how it can be integrated in the operator. Yeah. OK, anything else that comes to your mind, Rob? Uh, no, I think that clears up everything for me. Thanks very much. OK, then uh, let's wait for you to update the proposal. And if something else comes up later, we can, of course, discuss it on the on Slack, on mailing list, uh, on the on the PR or whatever, of course. So yeah. yeah thank you. Just, just out of curiosity, uh, did you, I, I don't know if you had a, a kind of POC working, uh, did you use any specific Kafka Golan library? I don't know, Sarama or something different? Yeah, we used Sarama. Okay. And uh, did you use it? So did you choose it because it was the, the most used or uh, did you compare with some other libraries and did you find that it's the, the better one, the best one? Uh, to be honest, it was Jeremy. Jeremy initially spun it up and chose that, so I just continued working with that one. So I'm, I'm not sure what his process for choosing that one was. Uh, I'm certainly open to suggestions for other ones, but um, yeah, that's that's the one I've been using so far. Okay. Let's pure go so that makes things easier, definitely. Okay, anything else to proposals? Okay, if uh, nothing else, then uh, I think the annual review didn't change much since last time. Uh, so we got look good to me for sandbox annual review from uh, Alena. So I'm not sure whether that means that it might get for one of the next DOC meetings or what the plan is. Uh, but I think that's the only change since last time. Then uh, I added a short note about the 020 release. So uh, yeah, I'm doing the RC3 
right now uh, because of the bug which we found in the Kafka roller with the pending uh, pending uh, pods and hopefully everyone can test this quickly because we did a lot of tests on the previous RCs and there's minimum of changes and uh, hopefully we can uh, then release it uh, I don't know tomorrow evening or over the weekend or something so once it's out everyone please test it any questions to that So then we had two discussions, which kind of flowed over from last meeting. And that was about the stateful sets and about uh, the update images uh, after a release when some CVs happen or something like that. So anyone had some time to thought a bit more about these? No, I'm sorry. I planned it to do, but then I didn't do. So, should we leave that for next time then, or? I think for the stateful sets one in particular, um, Maybe we need to sort of stimulate further discussion by drafting a proposal or something so that we can discuss something a little bit more concrete and less sort of wishy-washy. Yeah, I'm not sure it's just a proposal there. Maybe some kind of POC might be useful for that as well, right? To better yeah, understand. Yeah, I think it would be difficult to write a proposal without having done some experimentation to see so, what the pitfalls are. Does that sound reasonable to everyone else? Okay, Tom, I know you mostly spend the time with Kafka, so should I add it to my agenda? Yeah, please do. Okay, what about the second topic? The only thing that I remember from last time that we didn't really sort of um, talk about at all, um, and really this is kind of like a, a thing sort of for the release process and the, the build process as much as anything. Um, but has anyone looked at um, Jib? It's a Google um, thing for uh, building images. Um, it sort of integrates quite nicely with Maven and, and layers the images in sort of quite a, a sensible way. Um, you wanted which... to say a weird way? Hmm? Wanted, did you want it to say weird way instead of sensible way? Well, <laughs> it's got some logic to the way it does it. You might disagree with the logic, which is fine. Um, I just wonder if that might have a, a role in any change that we might make there or not. So how would it change the update flow? Wouldn't it just make it more complicated? Um, so one thing that we didn't really sort of discuss last time was the difference between um, changes to the, the base image. So CentOS basically um and then we've obviously on top of that base image 
we've got the JVM and you know that has updates and security fixes and stuff sometimes. Um, and then we've obviously got our dependencies um, in the operators, for example. Um, we didn't really sort of discuss those as sort of separate things to sort of figure out um, which of those might make more sense to um, support updates for than others, for example, because again, I, I think we discussed this last time is um, the relationship between being able to roll a new update um, and then sort of having container scanning and it's kind of like a a chicken and egg problem in a way in that um, it's only if you've got the the scanning set up that you know that you might want to do an update but you kind of don't really want to have the scanning set up until you've got the means to do it um, to create an update otherwise well you're just advertising the fact that your software is um, not up to date so well, I don't think that's a problem, right? A lot of users have scanning inside there. Well, that's true. Where they run it. Yeah, so I mean, anyone, anyone can scan the images. I'm not sure you really hide something what they, but at least many of them would not know anyway. So, yeah, I think there are kind of three layers, right? There is the base image, actual base image, so the CentOS currently. Then there's the Streamsy base, which is basically just the JVM. And then there's the R code, right? So changes to R code that should be patch releases in any case, I guess. Yes. So that leaves the two layers below, I think, for the discussion about this. Yeah. And I, yeah, so one of the obvious thing would be to kind of separate them in the build pipelines, for example to do the Java build, pass that as kind of artifacts somewhere and then have a separate phase to build the images. Mm -hmm. Since that allows you to rerun just some parts of it. Yeah. Yes, one of the nice things about, I mean, this is this is probably not relevant um, to exactly this discussion, but one of the nice things about using Jib to build the images is um, because of the layering, it knows if you change the dependencies or haven't changed the dependencies, so you can um, get away with um, only building the the layer with your code in most of the time. which is more of a sort of uh, development time concern than a release time concern. But So how would the Jeep deal with things like the Kafka binaries and so on? Um, to be honest, the Kafka binaries, yeah, the, the Kafka image is sort of obviously slightly different because, um, well, Obviously, well, would we go worrying about dependencies of Kafka's? Or would, do we just treat Kafka as a, a blob with its dependencies? Because if well, we go I... changing the Kafka dependencies, then we, you know, um, we really ought to be running the Kafka system tests to validate that. And we're no longer then distributing Apache Kafka version, whatever. We're distributing something else. So I I feel we probably shouldn't do that. Yeah, what I meant was something else, right? So 
if we change the Kafka binaries, then that's something what should have at least patch release of Streamsy, right? Yes, no, I agree about that. But so the thing I was more curious about is like we have all kind of different builds, right? So we don't do just the Java build. So we have one image which has the operator image is more or less uh, Java build and I can see how Jeep might fit in. But then we have all the images in Kafka and so on where I don't really understand how that fits in. Yeah. Um, yeah, we might end up with an awkward split. I mean, there are bits in the Kafka image, the agents, for example, that are our code. Um, I'd, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Like I, I, I've only sort of briefly read about it, and then sort of maybe uh, and then playing I think two the and two and making five here. Yeah. Then I think the other thing is that essentially what we are talking about is upgrades to the to the base image itself, right? The JVM changes, operating system changes, and so on. Not really the the Java code changes themselves. Yeah, I agree. Any actual, it's more, it's the Java dependencies, which I think potentially the Java dependencies of the operator and so on. Uh, yeah, but I don't think you should. The gray should area of it. I'm not sure you should change them without, without doing a patch release, to be honest. Uh -huh. So, I mean, you wouldn't expect the dependencies to change without their own patch release, right? Like you wouldn't expect yeah, someone to say, "Oh, that. I fixed, I fixed the Jackson one eleven one. It has the same version in Maven Central. It just has this fix inside. Mm -hmm. It would be a new patch release, right?" Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure yeah, whether that kind of, for me at least, that kind of change says we should do a patch release of the of the whole Streamsy and not just rebuild the things. Mm -hmm. But actually, that kind of rebuilding would not be that complicated, right? Because you can just update the tag basically in GitHub and everything would rebuild itself. So where are we going with this? It sounds like there's not a great appetite to do this. I don't know. It looks like the two of us have the appetite to do something about it. <laughs> <laughs> so I think there's certainly demand for that from the users with regards to the base images and JVM, right? Uh -huh. Because there is always someone, or not always, but it's not something what does, didn't come up or what come up just from a single person that the images have some some CVEs inside and whether we are using that or not that and so on. And in some of them, I think one part of the problem was the base image itself. So I think what I found out in some of the discussions was that the CentOS 7 image is not updated that much. And it doesn't really seem to have, the CentOS 7 doesn't seem to have like the same cadence of the bug fixes, which for example, RHEL has. Probably because it's just a community project with a lot less resources and so on. So actually, in some of the cases, uh, when I digged into it, I found out that, uh, yeah, there are some CVEs which have fixes, 
but these are actually not available in CentOS 7. So I think that's one part of the discussion, how uh, we feel about that and how much, I don't know, we want to use the UBI images from Red Hat or see if CentOS 8 is better or use something completely different. I think that's maybe something that should be part of this discussion as well. Okay. So, um, under the something different category, I guess, uh, and again, this sort of goes back to jib. Jib by default, and uh, maybe this is under <laughs> um, continuing to bark up the wrong tree, but distroless is uh, an interesting possibility under the something else category. Um, which would, as I understand it, massively sort of uh, shrink the possibilities for um, the CVEs in um, the things that we depend on, but yeah, would make our also... images less less sort of easy for people to exec into and do debugging because you wouldn't have all the, the tools. You'd have to use some sort of a debug pod, I guess. Yeah, I think it also massively shrinks the possibilities that a lot of the stuff will work, right? So I'm not sure how well Teeny would work inside, how well OpenSSL would work inside. Oh, I forgot Teeny. How well all the native builds. So maybe Teeny is not needed in a distroless uh, environment, right? But how well all the native builds inside the Kafka jars will work? because a lot of these things have the problems with uh, things like Alpine that it and now I will be totally making the stuff up because I never understood how it really works but Alpine has this problem that it doesn't have glibc or something like that and then you find out that half of the things doesn't run on it properly because all the native builds expect some of the basic libraries to be there and then you need some special builds of that and so on so i'm quite curious how with this troll would these things work in kafka yeah that's a good point about libsy glibsy libsy i mean um yeah well we wouldn't unless we can find um do some research and find out, then we wouldn't know for sure unless we tried it ourselves, which would be a commitment of some amount of time. Um, so maybe sticking with um, a fatter image that we have got more confidence would work would be the better bet. Um, whether CentOS 8 has um, got a better sort of update policy than CentOS 7. How could we find that out? I think you would need to try that next time we you know that some CV is floating around for, I don't know, JVM or some stupid internal library to see how quickly these update or don't update. I also think we need to have clear agreement on the direction from everyone else, right? Because all, or maybe not the CentOS 8, UBI 8, CentOS 7, and so on discussions are separate. But like it doesn't, you can spend a lot of time investigating some base how to do the rebuilds. But if then afterwards everyone comes and says, oh, doing a, rebase on a different uh, base image should be a patch release or something like that, then all that's wasted effort, right? So I think we should have also some agreement on the direction we wanna go in terms of what should or should not be updated without a new release, because that then gives you some framework within which you can investigate the options, right?
and given it just the two of us talking, I'm not completely sure we have that or not. Yeah, it has been an episode of the Tom and Jakob show so far. And it doesn't look like it's going to change. <laughs> So what do we do with this point? Well, I, I don't see how we can make progress unless at least some of the other maintainers pipe up and express an opinion one way or another. So if no one's prepared to do that, then I guess we have to park it and maybe come back to it in at a later date. Yeah, I think I'd need to read up more on the different options before I was able to uh, give a thoughtful opinion on the topic. <laughs> but yeah, um, for like rebasing onto different distros, it's always a massive pain. I've uh, tried to rebase Strimzy onto Alpine and as Jakob said, it's a glibc nightmare and you have to natively compile everything yourself every single dependency that you need which can be pretty awful yeah i think the life is a bit easier when you stay within the traditional yeah. distros like obviously i know some people who consume strimsy have their own different flavors like ubi etc but even rebasing onto UBI is a bit of a faff. It's a bit more straightforward because CentOS and, and RHEL are not too different, at least from my perspective. Um, but it, yeah, it's still not easy. So should we park this by saying that people should do a bit more thinking and investigation about it? Yeah, I'll need to look into Jib. Is that a commitment to do that? Yeah, I'll, I'll look into Jib. But it already sounds like it's not a fantastic fit given the nature of some of our images. I think uh, I think it could be a, a better fit for development time. Um, but then I've always had more of a problem than everyone else about the amount of time I spend waiting for stuff to build. Yeah, it's and I've good. you know I've I've changed one line of Java. Yeah. Um, and yeah, the lack of proper sort of dependency tracking and stuff means that yeah. you end up spending ten minutes building, which is a well, waste of my life. I think it's fairly risky to have a completely different way how to build the things for development and release. Right. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm not suggesting that we have different ways to do it. It's just I kind of saw that as scratching a second itch I've got, that's all. So like this? Yeah, I think that makes sense. Okay, then uh, we have the last three minutes. So anyone has any other uh, can, I, can I nab that quickly? Um, so I don't know if many people, can I share my screen? Is that okay? Yeah, wait, I will stop my sharing. Uh, I, oh. uh, this weird system, I might need to give you some, um, some weird permission. If, if it's easier, you could also just open up my PR, the draft one. Um, oh, right, I yeah. totally forgot. I wanted to uh, uh, talk about um, basically I'm adding functionality so that you can run Strimzy just with roles instead of cluster roles. And there's a pretty compelling customer use case, I think, where people don't want to have to give cluster roles permissions to an operator if it doesn't need it. Um, part of these changes is to change the entity operator from using cluster role 
um, role bindings to cluster roles to role bindings to roles. Um, and I wanted to avoid any backwards compatibility implications by basically making this a, a toggle on, so a new feature, and then you have to put a new MVAR setting it to true. Um, and Jakob and I had a bit of a discussion, and we just wanted to make sure that we need to set a good precedent for basically feature flagging new optional features. Does adding it to the cluster operator config via an MVAR, similar to what was done for like the uh, the timeout milliseconds, as well as the um, oh, there's a thing where you can deploy the it deploys the cluster roles for you into the cluster and stuff like that. Do are people happy with us feature flagging via MVAR, or is there um, is there a alternative that I haven't considered here? So the thing which I was wondering about, given that I think some of the users have also issues with other parts like the network policies yeah which might make sense to feature flag as well is around things like i think in general the input will be always environment variable yeah but the question is whether we then have 10 different environment variables for all for each one for different feature flag or whether for example we have uh, some uh, uh kind of one variable where the feature flags are somehow comma separated list or something like that and then i think the other thing i was wondering about quite often like in both in your case but also with the network policies you probably need to access it from many different places not yep. necessarily in the same classes and so on and I was wondering whether kind of reading the environment variable in each of these is basically from the system get env is the right way or whether we should have, for example, some uh, some class which is, I don't know, singleton class or object or whatever the right terminology is initialized so I... on the beginning, which you then can use from everywhere and simply call out to get the value of the flag or whether that's something what we want to have. So so the problem of the singleton class is it becomes kind of a, not a pain to mock necessarily, but it does feel kind of hacky at points. So what I did was I've actually moved it in between you looking at it to the cluster operator config where, um, where there are other NVARs like this. Um, I think, yeah. Um, and this is obviously, like sort of mocked up or um, just set for different uh, tests. And it becomes really easy just to switch uh, the Boolean on or off. Um, uh, so I thought that this was a good precedent. I do agree. It might be nicer if we have a single MVAR and then like a nested list or a, a, I don't know, like a, a JSON object or something. But those are also, they, they have their trade-offs, right? Because the user, it's harder for the user to configure and they're pretty, they're always a pain to parse and like it'll just error and sometimes the user won't see the error and stuff like that. Uh, if we don't anticipate having many feature flags, then having the feature flags having standalone MVARs seems reasonable to me, but it really is a case of what do we think going into the future is going to be the case? Is there any performance cost or any other cost related to having lots and lots of NVARs? I don't think there's the performance cost to it. Um, I do wonder about things like um, cases where you might have a dependency between two features, so you can't have feature A unless you've got feature B, um, yes. or kind of um, versioning of features, perhaps, where you know you sort of the way you implement feature A um, might change. Um, yeah. over time and, you know, being able to go from sort of the version one implementation to the version two implementation. Um, so it might warrant a bit of thinking about, obviously yeah. we're a couple of minutes over. Um, which one is this? It's three, eight, four, five. Yeah. I added it to the meeting minutes as well. Okay. Thanks. Um, 
I'll have a look and have a think, and hopefully um, <clears throat> I'll be able to make a comment or two. I, I think the good thing about Woo is when you put it in the cluster operator config, because it gets harder to access that from subclasses, the way that I've constructed it is only the assembly operator is really in, in knowing of how to implement each feature flag, which works just fine for the roles versus cluster roles. Whether that will work well for other things, I'm not 100% sure. Um, but at least for this, it, it just seemed to work really nicely. So we generate the different role bindings, and then we actually reconcile the correct one in the assembly operator based on what we believe to be the one that we should be uh, using. Um, yeah, there was a lot of changes. Um, but yeah, uh, I think for now, leaving it in this test is fine. Sorry, in this class is fine, but I just wanted to check. So I think, yeah, I think the problematic thing about having this just in the assembly operator is that in many cases you will end up having to pass that to some subclasses, right? Uh, I haven't had to do that for this one because you have two different alternate. So what you do yeah, is you basically do if else for everything. Yeah. yeah, but that's instead of passing the Boolean in, which I think is correct most of the time, because you want to avoid Boolean parameters. You just have to, so you'd have like, say if you needed a model that needed to have like a specific feature, then you'd have a like feature flagged version of the method that you'd call when the feature flag is enabled or yeah, set. Well, I mean, this works probably well if what you want to do is just create it or not create it. Yeah. But if you want, would want to have, for example, different flag inside some resource, yeah. then you would already need to pass it in, right? Agreed. But you probably just pass in a string or something, which is probably not that bad. Again, you could probably construct a use case that this would fall apart. But uh, what's the likelihood that, that we come across that use case? And does it offer up a precedent that this is not a good path to take. And I'm not saying that I'm right or wrong here. I, I am just genuinely curious about whether we should go down this road. Yeah, to be honest, um, I don't really have a clear opinion about that either. So. Yeah. I think this isn't going to happen very often, to be honest. I mean, I could just switch to always using roles if possible, but I could see that possibly causing some issues for customers that are like, why are we creating roles now? I was happy with cluster roles, you know? Um, so probably not gonna well, happen. But... At some point you need to cut the functionality if you leave out the uh, roles and cluster roles, yeah. right? Yeah. So that's some things I didn't really had the time to look into your PR in more detail it, apart no, from the initial discussion. But we would need to make sure that the users using this understand the limitations, right? No exactly. node ports, no rec awareness, uh, and so on. Yeah. So it's basically absolutely not production ready deployment. But maybe that's more a documentation thing, uh, since I don't think you are planning yeah. to enable that by default. Yeah. And then, to be honest, the users are really stupid, right? Uh, and I have to say that because you will always be discussing with people like who want you to give every application the absolutely minimal, right? Yeah. Which it needs on the fly. But at the same time, they will not want to give you any rights to do anything. So, yeah. Yeah, OK, so I guess uh, Tom said he will have a look at it if he comes up with something better. Yeah. So I guess that's the conclusion. No one screamed that it sounded like an awful idea, so. So given we are almost 10 minutes over,
Anyone has anything else? Last word? Famous last word? In that case, I guess uh, that's it for today. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Thanks very Thank much. Thanks, Vex.